streaming. It's time for Clubhouse Chatter. Here's Norm Ordez. That's right. Back for a second show. And my guest for the second show is the one and the only, the last 30-game winner in the major leagues, Denny McLean. Denny, how you doing today? I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. So you're on your you're on the way to Cooperstown. Uh, we are in Cooperstown, right? And uh, what is what is the scene in Cooperstown right now? Is it starting to get crazy? Well, it's, no, it's pretty subdued right now. It won't be crazy until uh, it's probably starting tomorrow afternoon. But uh, it is a great event. It's a great festival. It's a great celebration of what the game is all about. And lots of great people will be here. In fact, this will be the largest uh, number of Hall of Famers and other players in this city uh, since the inception of the Hall of Fame. It's going to be quite a year. Wow. And that's always exciting. You know, it's always it's always around my birthday, and so usually that Sunday I'll sit down and I'll watch bits and pieces of it. Um, I still think one of the, my favorite speeches was the one that Ricky Henderson gave a couple of years ago where he mentioned Tom Treblehorn, and Tom Treblehorn was the manager over here at Salem-Kaiser Volcanoes, so that one kind of hit home. But there's been a ton, and this year's class is a great class. Listen, um, you know, with the exception of last year when all the writers made it a joke, uh, the bottom line is it is a great place to visit at any time of year. This is just a little bit bigger and better than it normally is. But this is a great city to visit. The whole town, is uh, they've only got about 2,000 citizens in the, in the entire market. And it's just fun to be here. If, you, if you're into the game and if you're not into the game, you will learn some history here uh, and how it affected certain things in this country. Uh, some of the things that we did were done with baseball players and baseball players doing some things for the government surreptitiously and otherwise there's a lot to learn here it is it is as good as disney i've always told people that it is not a one-day show if you come you got a plan of being here at least three days so you can take in about 50 percent of it there are more than a million pieces of memorabilia in a warehouse in warehouses i should say um and uh that's a million pieces plus everything they have on display in fact it's supposed to be closer now to two million pieces wow but the bottom line is there's a, there's a ton of history here, and if you can't learn anything here, then you know you either don't want to either you don't want to learn or you or you you don't read very well. That's all. So what items do you have in the Hall of Fame? You know, I, there's a number of items, I, and I'm finding out. Uh, I found out uh, yesterday there were a number that I didn't even know about. So um, I'm, we're going over there today to find out what is and what isn't, and uh, we'll, we'll we'll be able to better report that. Uh, in the next couple of days. So let's talk a little bit about your career. So you won the Cy Young twice. You went 31 and 6 in 1968. Tell us a little bit about that that season. Um, well, you know, listen, it was it was a great year. Uh, the most important part is um, that uh, we were. Um, we won the championship, I and mean, we won our division, and we then we won the the uh, uh, World Series, and that and that's what it was all about. The city had just had a fire. Uh, we had a riot the year before; forty-two people got killed. And the bottom line simply is that it was magic for the city of Detroit. That's, I mean, there's nothing more that can be said because uh, it, it healed the town for a while, at least put it on hold, while everybody got up every morning to find out what the Tigers were doing. And that was worth its weight in gold. Um, it, it was just one of those magical moments. So I want to, first of all, I want to point out to my wife's family is from the Detroit area, and they're huge Tigers fans. And they're actually, they're really excited that I'm talking to you today. I'm excited as well. But being Tiger fans, you know, and, and growing up in Detroit during that time, they're ecstatic. So I want to say hello to them and, and um, with me again is, is um, Denny McLean, the last 30-game winner in the major leagues. Um, Denny, that's something that will never be done again. Well, that's probably right. Uh, you know, the game has changed dramatically once they reduce the mound and move these guys to pitch in five or six innings uh, every fifth or sixth day. They change forever. They also, they also dramatically 
affected a number of things. One, Hall of Famers. How does a guy get into the Hall of Fame with five uh, uh, complete games in his career or 10 or 15? You know, the game was based upon completing games. I mean, yep. pitching. Pitching is still 90, 95% of the game. Uh, and there's so many other things that the game now does not effectively deal with. And record-keeping is one of those. Um, and unless they do something to 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 put everything in the proper perspective of what happened uh, before and what's happening now since the advent of all these drugs, all these steroids, all of these weightlifting things, everything that they take, uh, you know, the game has almost got to be separated and categorized, and uh, maybe somebody will one day. But the first thing they need to do with this epidemic is they got so many people that are getting hurt. They need to raise the mound again. If they raise the mound again, they'll reduce the injuries, I'm told, by 50 or 60 percent. Um, and uh, if that can be done, then these kids will pitch a lot longer and be better pitchers for it, too. So it was a little bit different back when, back when you were throwing. Now, you also had arm injuries, too, but I don't believe it was anything like what they're having today, correct? No, I, I uh, wound up I had 120 cortisone shots. Uh, I, I mean, 200 cortisone shots by the time I ended my career. Uh, we had the same injuries. There, there wasn't anything different. The difference was we pitched with we pitched with the injuries because we were lied to all of those years. Right. And uh, uh, the bottom line simply is that uh, – um, unless you know what you're doing, uh, today they've got lawyers, accountants, uh, psychologists, psychiatrists. They got everything that people need um, uh, when it comes to uh, managing and being able to understand what your career is all about. Um, so what I'm saying is they're being much more protected today. But on the other hand, I think the game is being hurt because they don't pitch more. But but how do you balance those two? Because one's talking about a career and the other is talking about being able to walk away from the game in one piece. And there aren't many people in many games professionally that walk away from the game without some kind of injury. Right. And so, you you know, you had you had a relatively shorter career. Um well, I played 10 years. Right. and But, you know, I mean, man, I mean, there for like three or four seasons, I mean, you went 31 and 6. And then the following year in, in um, 69, you had a great year. You also won the Cy Young that year, too, correct? Yeah, well, I had, uh, you know, most people say you take a look at a pitcher for a five year run. And uh, I won 108 games in five years. And, That's pretty um, dang good. Yeah. You know, you know, that's pretty good. In fact, I was the, uh, I think, only one person that had more wins in their major league career than I did over a five-year period of time. And um, uh, and that's not a bogotious statement. It's, it's just the facts of the matter because some. I think people overlook the significance of that five-year run. I mean, Koufax, look at Koufax's five-year run. Look at Drysdale. You pick any of them. Pick any of them. Take their five-year run, their best five years. And not many of them had five real good years in a row. Right. And that's what you that's what you got to measure. But um, and that's what I mean. The game has changed. They, they look at more sensational. They, they're always looking at a guy who, for five innings, has got a no hitter going. Uh, you know, it, it, five innings a no hitter, and then they don't pitch the eighth, the ninth, or the seventh because somebody else came in to relieve them. I mean, it, it's um, you know, it's just being promoted in a better way, in a better way, in a sense, in a, in a worse way, in a sense. But they've got such a great marketing program now in, in uh, MLB. They know what the hell they're. Doing, and uh, God bless them because the game is bigger and better than what it's ever been in the past. Those guys that played in the 30s, 40s, 50s, and before that, uh, the hell that they went through, the the uh, the uh, domineering owners that were there at that time, through the 60s and 70s, we too, we couldn't go anywhere. We never had free agency. We couldn't right. do anything. But the bottom line simply was, you know, you dealt with it, you moved on, and uh, you were doing what you wanted to do from the time you were five years old and t- uh, from the first day that you understood uh, what life was all about if you were going to be a professional baseball player. So you touched a little bit about on complete games, and that's kind of a kind of a stat that you really don't hear. I mean, pitchers, you know, they don't have the 15, 20, 30 complete games like what they did back in the, you know, the 40s, 50s, and 60s. Do you think pitchers are coddled way too much this, um, these days? You know, I don't know. I, you know, I don't know. I, I, I only know, um, I only know that, uh, the pitching is dramatically different than throwing the ball soft 
underarm, uh, thrown underhanded, and the game, no game was meant to throw a, a, a baseball or a spear or anything else over the top. And that's where all the pressure and stress comes from. If we were allowed to throw underarm, some of us would still be pitching at the age of 50, 60 years old. I mean, <laughs> underhanded. True. So it's a, it's a different game, a different world, and uh, they're better protected today because they got money involved in these guys. We didn't have that kind of money. I mean, I made four hundred forty thousand dollars in my ten-year career, and that was considered great, by the way. Um, and uh, but on the other hand, the major league minimum today is five hundred thousand dollars. That's the major league minimum. When a first-year player in the major leagues gets to the big leagues, the least he can make is five hundred thousand dollars a year. That's a pretty good start. That is a pretty good start. What was so was your thirty thirty one and six season? Was that the highlight of your career? Well, it, it certainly. I mean, I, I mean, as far as a personal accomplishment, uh, it ranks as number one. And then there's one A. One A was uh, simply we won the pennant in the World Series that year, also. And that was, as I said earlier, that was all about the city being saved, the Tiger players doing the right thing, working with the police athletic leagues, working with the YMCA's, working with the high schools and the colleges and the grammar schools. Listen, that baseball team kept that city. Pistol in 1968. We killed, somebody killed 42 people in 1967. And that didn't happen in 68. Everybody went to bed with their transistor radio. Everybody woke up in the morning with their transistor radio had they not heard the finish. Uh, you know, it was it was just a, a great year in more ways than one. Good. If So you got the young pitchers today. If you were to give them some advice, what would the advice be? Uh, what age? What age you talking about? Um, you know what? Let's go. Let's say fourteen to nineteen years old. Well, you know the the dumbest thing I see is little league baseball. I mean, I got good friends in the management of little league baseball. I, I think their studies are flawed to some degree. But to tell me that uh, to suggest to me that no damage happens to a kid's arm between the age of uh, eight, nine, ten, and eighteen or nineteen years old when you start trying to throw a curveball and a slider, I think it's it's uh, absolutely ludicrous when you see on TV in some of the championship games of the little league or Babe Ruth guys out there throwing curveballs and sliders. And that's the manager's fault because that manager's allowed him to throw those pitches because the damn manager wants to win bad. All he wants to do is win, win, win. The child's uh, the child situation is not put first. And Little League Baseball does a great job. They got great rules, 85 pitches a week that they can throw. Here's the problem. All of those kids in those Little League teams, and most of them are stars when you talk about a team getting to that level uh, of competition. The bottom line simply is they're playing another 200 innings a week or, or 50 innings a week with another traveling team. So the 85 pitches may apply in Little League, but every other day they're pitching for another team. So someone's got to get that under control. And if you're going to throw the ball, you know, if you're going to throw 200 pitches, 250 pitches, don't throw the curveball. Don't throw the slider. Don't throw these goofy pitches because that put you in a precarious position and you will at the age of 12 13 14 15 you will hurt yourself that's what upsets me with with uh, amateur baseball that they don't put the kid ahead of their winning all these coaches not all of them but a, a big bunch of them they want to see their pitchers do what's necessary to win and win only yes winning is what it's all about but winning is what it's all about when you get to that level we should be developing fundamentals we should be developing better players we should be developing better coaching uh, all of that should be developed, and uh, I think uh, winning should should not be in the top five. Very good. So now, how is your wife, by the way? She had a little bit of stay in the hospital here not too long ago. My wife is very uh, – she's hurt very badly. She just had um, – Spinal and vertebrae surgery that cut off about two inches of her spine of her uh, vertebrae. Uh, she's having a tough time right now. She's in a lot of pain, and uh, you know what? It's a battle. It's one of those. It's it, it, you know, like I told her, I said this is a we got to go a complete game here. Uh, we got to pitch nine innings here. We got to get through this. We got to make this work. And uh, so we 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 do it one hour, one minute at a time, and hopefully we'll get a complete game out of this. And sooner or later, she'll be better. Well, we definitely, you know, pray and give uh, give you our best. And now that is the daughter of Lou Boudreau, correct? Yes, that's and right. How did you How did you meet her? 
Well, that's a real long story, and uh, we can't get into it today. Okay. But uh, the bottom line, I met her at a, I met her at a, a function. Our baseball team I was playing on was uh, won the state championship in Illinois, and uh, her dad was there, and her dad in, and her dad introduced me to Sharon. So that's how it all started 51 years ago. So you married into the Lou Boudreau family. That's pretty cool. So yeah, well, I've, I've always said Lou Boudreau married into the Denny McLean oh, family. So there, there you go. So now, also, you've recently lost a ton of weight. I have. I've lost 180 pounds. Wow. I had bariatric, I had bariatric surgery about 11 and a half months ago, and I feel wonderful. Anybody with the, with an obesity problem, a fat problem, overweight problem, whatever you want to call it, uh, you got to you got to look into the uh, bariatric surgery, folks. I'm telling you, the the, the operation I had is called the. Um, what the hell is it called? Uh, the sleeve, S L E E V E, and what it does is it reduces the size of your stomach. And I have lost—I literally have lost my appetite for meat. I haven't had any meat now in almost a year. Wow. And I don't know why. There's no explanation for it. The doctor doesn't understand it. But uh, I literally survive on on Propel drink, uh, some uh, protein, and additionally, I eat a lot of peanuts for some reason. I don't know <laughs> if I'm turning into a monkey or, but I eat a lot of peanuts every day, and and I've never felt better in my life I'm not, I'm not in pitching shape but i'm uh you know i'm carrying around good. 180 180 pounds less than i once did you look good you look really I feel, good i feel great i feel great thank you now and you at one point in your career you drank a, what i think case of pepsi a day was it yeah, 18 to 24 a day yeah wow Wow, that's crazy. Yeah, right. that's, that's a lot of Pepsi. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. But my doctor says the only reason I lived this long is because I've never drank and I've never smoked. Well, wow. once again, Denny McLean on the show, and uh, Denny, we thank you for uh, coming on. And I know you got you know business there in Cooperstown to deal with, and uh, we'd love to have you on again sometime soon. And you know, like yeah, I said, and anybody. Anybody coming out to Cooperstown this uh, this weekend? We're here Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. As I said earlier, it's going to be the largest contingency of Hall of Fame signers and appearances in the history of Cooperstown. This is the biggest there ever was. We've got great guys being inducted this weekend. Great for the game. Great personalities, and just great for Cooperstown. So, anyone in the area, is anybody out there listening, please uh, try to come and say hello. And and you can't miss anybody because everything happens on Main Street in about three blocks. And uh, after that, you're you're not in Cooperstown anymore. There's only 2,000 people in the whole town, but this weekend there will be over 100,000. So one final question about the Hall of Fame. Does Pete Rose belong in the Hall? I'll let you, I'll let you answer it in your own. I'll, I'll, you, what you have to do, because uh, I get asked that question all the time. Pete's a very dear friend of mine. Um, I wish he did belong in the Hall of Fame. But the bottom line with Pete is, there's a report called the Dowd Report, D-O-W-D. And if you read the Dowd Report, you make your own decision, and I promise and guarantee you it will not be the answer you want to make. Pete, again, is a friend of mine. He knows how I feel. I, I think Pete knows. I mean, now they've alluded to the fact they're going to do something for Pete in Cincinnati next year because right. it's an all-star game. Don't anybody try to read any more between the lines than that. That's what it's going to be, they say, and that's all it's going to be. But you know what? You never know. That could be the first step moving in the right direction for Pete. But on the other hand, if you let Pete Rose in, you got to let everybody else in. Everybody. That's uh, Shubas Joe Jackson. That whole 1919 crew. Those were superstars of about 10 of those guys, uh, So and the other guys that they were playing. And there's a whole bunch of other guys. I suggest that they go to the Hall of Fame and take the guys out that shouldn't be there. Ty Cobb, head of the KKK in Georgia yep. for many years. Stab people. Uh, uh, literally was accused of killing people. Uh, there's a whole bunch I could ramble off here if we had more time, but uh, that, that's what I've always suggested. Go back to the Hall of Fame and either make it for what you did on the field or don't do it. You know, one you can't have both things, and now our committees have become judgmental in nature. Um, Pete Lowe's, the reason why Pete doesn't belong is because he bet on the game, and he bet. He, number one, nobody can miss that placard in every clubhouse. Number two, yep. Pete. Pete knew better. Pete was a manager. Pete was a smart guy. And once you bet 
either for your club or against your club, you have violated every rule that there is. And gambling is the number one threat to the to Major League Baseball. It continues to be, although the money makes up for a lot of problems that people don't have anymore. But gambling continues to be the biggest threat to baseball than drugs. There you go, Mr. Denny McLean. Denny, have fun in Cooperstown. I'll be watching. One of these days I'm going to be able to get up to uh, – you know, that place that you just said was better than Disneyland, and I believe you. Um, once again, thank you very much, and we give you, give you. your wife our best. And oh, well. Thank you very much. You guys have a great day and have a great weekend, guys. Hey, you too. Thank you very much. Once again, Mr. Denny McLean on the show. Man, that was awesome. Brian, what do you think? Denny is an intense person. You can yeah. see the – you can just feel the intensity over the phone. Can you imagine when he was in his prime plane? I just love putting you on the Watch spot. Watch out. I just love putting you on the spot. Man, you know, I, I didn't, that, the Dowd report, that wasn't the answer that I was really looking for with the Pete Rose. I was, like, looking for a yes. No, well, he's shot out the Dowd you know, report, which said he bet on baseball. That is the one thing about Denny that you will hear, that he is honest and upfront, and a lot of people don't like that. And, you know, Denny has definitely had some issues along the way, you know, and I'm not going to, you know, get into it. He is what he is. And that is he is the last 30-game winner in the major leagues. And I think, you know, they talk about records that will never be broken. I don't think there's any chance that that record is broken. Not with the way baseball is played nowadays. You know, 31-6 and six in 1968. Pitchers today get 33 to 35 starts a season. Look at Felix Fernandez. Or Felix Hernandez. I mean, 30 games, he's lucky to get 32, 33 games. Yes. He's got to win them all. And with those games, he doesn't even, you know... You know, with the Mariners, you know they score one or two runs, and he may give up one or two runs, and there's probably eight, nine, ten games a year where there's no decision. Right. You know, you're not going to get those thirty games. It's crazy. It's crazy. So I would like to bring. Um, we got some friends over in Israel, and um, Nate Fish, King of Jewish Baseball, and all you know the Israeli national team. I've interviewed quite a few of them, and we follow Nate Fish, and one of theirs has fallen. And um, I, I, I'm going to butcher this name, but it's Sean, Sean Munshine. He was 19. He was in the Israeli Defense Force. Um, he was killed in action this past week with the, uh, the war with you know, the Gaza Hamas and stuff like that. He was 19. He was a part of the Tel Aviv Junior Comrades. And so he played baseball there in Israel. And, uh, you know, our thoughts go to those guys. You know, not only to the Israelis, but, I mean, you know, to the people living in the Gaza, you know, that, that area, the whole area. You know, it takes two to tango, is what I've always been told. And, you know, war is stupid and and terrible and wish it you know it would end and you know there's innocent lives there's lives being lost on both sides and i i normally don't get political um about it but you know it's 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 got to stop you know but our our prayers and thoughts are definitely with our friends over there in israel and um hoping that it stops soon so i'm norm this is producer brian we're going to take a couple of weeks off and when we come back, there is a rumor, a rumor in August that we get Ferguson Jenkins coming on the show. So we shall see. Hey, we're out of here. Thanks for watching.